All right, so let's get into the session itself into today's training. Um, once again, my name is Praveen Joseph. I'm um, part of the cybersecurity team here at Ingram Micro, and I'm joining you from our, um, our center of excellence office, which is located in Dubai. Um, just to give you a quick overview about our, ourselves, we are a cybersecurity division within Ingram Micro. Ingram Micro, as you are well aware, is the largest technology distributor on the planet. Uh, $50 billion company, 50 plus billion dollars and uh, 35,000 uh, plus employees all over the world. Operations in close to 250 countries. So very, very large, massive con company and um, with a very strong and vibrant global presence. Um, the cyber security team, we are headquartered here in Dubai and uh, the division itself is more than three years old by now. I think close to three and a half in fact. And um, we are a team of cyber security consultants, trainers, auditors, solutions architects. Um, uh, and, and we also offer um, you know, a whole slew of services around consultancy um, training, of course, which is what you're seeing here with me today. And also managed security services, security operation centers, um, and, and even MDR for that matter, managed detection and response. We also assist our partners and end customers in incident response. Um, if at all you or your end customers have been the unfortunate victims of a cyber security attack, we are the guys you need to go to because we can help you to recover from these incidents very, very quickly. Uh, and in fact, we've seen uh, ever since the COVID-19 scenario started playing out, we've seen a massive spurt in the number of cyber attacks experienced by, by our customers here in the region, particularly ransomware. I, I, I'm thinking people are clicking on a lot of these uh, COVID-19 related phishing, phishing emails which are circulating. Nevertheless, that was a quick introduction to ourselves. We'll now jump into the core topic for today's discussion, which is PCI DSS. The structure for today's session is very, very straightforward, as you can see over here. We'll first of all try to understand the standard itself, PCI DSS. It's um, one of the most granular, one of the most technical information security standards out there. And uh, it's been in existence for quite a long time, PCI DSS. So we'll try to understand a little bit about the history of the standard. Wh what are the entities which are involved in a PCI DSS regulatory ecosystem? Who are the um, uh, PCI Council for that matter? And who does PCI apply to? All of this we'll try to cover in point number one. In point number two, we're going to look at the components which are involved in a payment ecosystem. We'll start with the most fundamental component, which is the payment card itself. What are the components of your, of your everyday credit and debit card? We'll try to understand those components because this is important to know before you jump into the standard itself. And then in section number three, who are the entities in a simple payment ecosystem? The next time you walk up to car four and you sign and you swipe your credit card at the POS terminal, you're sure to remember the points that we speak about right now in section number three. What happens when you swipe your card at a POS terminal? The entire payment ecosystem that is behind this process, we will have a very, very solid understanding by the time we complete number three. Finally, in number four, we are going to speak about the PCI DSS requirements, right? So this is the way in which I've structured it. For those of you who have just joined us, um, I'll, I'll repeat the same point I mentioned earlier. PCI DSS has 300 plus requirements and the, the detailed coverage of these requirements is something that we will not be doing today. We will look at the requirements, but we will do it at a high level. We're not going to do a deep dive because this is a fundamental training where you'll have where you'll walk away with a solid understanding of the standard as well as what each requirement entails. But we're not going to go into the details of how to implement the requirements. What are the challenges that you will face? These are in fact things that we cover as part of, a, of our two day PCI DSS training. If you wish to enroll for this particular you know, two day training on PCI DSS, let me know. I'll be more than happy to take you up for it. I'm the, I'm the same person who's giving the training for, for the two day PCI DSS as well. Very happy to link you up and uh, and get this sorted. OK, with this, let's get going into the slides itself. We'll first start with introduction to PCI DSS. Now, what really is PCI DSS? I'm sure no one in this room today is a stranger to this particular standard, the payment card industry data security standards, because this standard has been in existence for a very, very long time. And it has gained a lot of popularity 
within in fact a short span of time. Today, you can be pretty confident that if an organization is saying that they are certified in PCI DSS, you can be pretty confident that yes, they are meeting a minimum baseline of security because achieving compliance with PCI DSS is no mean achievement. It's very, very difficult. And this is why it is one of the most respected information security standards out there. So the standard itself was developed in order to enhance cardholder data security and to facilitate the broad adoption of consistent data security measures globally. What do I mean by this? I will tell you as we go down the slides. The intention was to prevent the occurrence of data security attacks pertaining to credit and debit cards. As more and more payments started becoming digital, I'm speaking in the early 2000s, as more and more payments started becoming digital and people became more and more comfortable putting up their payment cards, their credit and debit card numbers on digital platforms, on, on POS terminals and so on. The number of breaches that were experienced by organizations processing these payment information also started increasing. So for this reason, each of these um, entities behind these payment cards, when I say entities, I'm referring to Visa, MasterCard, American Express and so on. By the way, I will explain to you these entities as well as we go down. They felt that there was a need to have consistent data security measures. What do I mean by this? Visa had their own Visa security standards for those who are using Visa cards. MasterCard had their own. Now consider you are a bank. You will have a relationship with both Visa as well as MasterCard and you, you will find it difficult to have a security program for Visa and another one for MasterCard, whereas there's a lot of overlap between the requirements. So it's a lot of rework and a lot of confusion. In order to eliminate all of this additional tasks and confusion is why Visa, MasterCard, American Express, JCB as well as Discover, these five payment brands, they came together and they wanted to achieve these two words, which these two phrases, which I put here in bold, bold. First of all, enhance cardholder data security and second of all, consistent data security measures, which means prevent these attacks from happening. As like I mentioned, you're seeing a lot of attacks at the same time, facilitate consistent data security measures across all entities involved in a payment security. So which means no rework, no redundancy. You have one single platform, one single framework of reference for all of the entities to pursue. Who does PCI DSS apply to? This is the next question. When an organization tells you that PCI DSS is such an excellent standard and so on and so forth, the first question we need to ask them is, but have you really understood which part of your business PCI DSS applies to? In fact, uh, by the way, I, I used to be a PCI QSA and I've done a lot of PCI DSS audits. So I'll give you a lot of examples from my uh, from my practical experience as well. Um, when you're going to certify an organization on PCI DSS, there is a best practice, which means uh, one of the best practices is minimization of scope, which means reduce your footprint within your business where PCI DSS applies. You have to do this in order to reduce the overall cost of compliance in order to reduce your risk exposure itself. Now, how do I do this? How do I reduce the scope? This is where I will try to ask myself, which part of my business does PCI DSS apply to? Simple definition, any entity which is storing, processing or transmitting cardholder data and slash or sensitive authentication data. This is a definition which is lying at the heart of the standard itself. No matter which part of the business you're looking at, you need to ask yourself, is this, is this laptop storing, processing or transmitting any cardholder data? Is this server storing, processing or transmitting cardholder data or sensitive authentication data? If the answer is no, and if the answer is it is not even connected to a component which is storing, processing or transmitting cardholder data, you can remove it. You can remove it from your scoped environment. So any part of your business or any part of an entity where cardholder data or sensitive authentication data is being stored, maybe it's in a USB stick, maybe it's in a database server, maybe even a cloud service provider where it's where card numbers are being hosted or it's being processed because one of your employees is looking at card numbers on the screen. They are not able to see it. I'm, I'm sorry, they're not able to copy paste it, but they're just looking at it. That also is sufficient to bring it into scope. 
or it's being transmitted. We are transmitting through the, through a, uh, through a LAN cable from point A to point B. Card numbers are being transmitted. You'll get the require the the response that tells you. But you know what? We are encrypting the card numbers. It doesn't matter. Even if it is encrypted, PCI DSS will apply. So these words that you see on this slide are extremely important because it will help you to determine to determine which part of your business PCI DSS applies to or it doesn't. Now, it was interesting that I used some new words over here, CHD and SAD, cardholder data and sensitive authentication data. Do not worry, we are going to try to define these as well as we go down the slides. A little bit about the history of PCI DSS. Visa's CISP program was announced in 1999. This was a information security program for any entity that was processing, storing, transmitting visa related credit card or debit card data. Similarly, the other major payment brands, MasterCard, American Express, JCB, Discover, they had their own security programs. This is what I was telling you at the beginning, guys, when I was talking about the objectives of PCI DSS. As you can see, you have different information security standards, which caused a lot of confusion amongst merchants. When I say merchants, I mean those entities who are trying to comply with PCI DSS. Can be Carrefour, can be your mom and pop shop, can be a hospital, anybody who's accepting payment cards online or at a post terminal. So in order to come out with a unified approach, Visa, MasterCard, JCB, Discover, and Amex, they came together to create a uniform set of regulations and data security standards, which is the PCI DSS standards as we know today. In fact, these five bodies, they decided to constitute an entirely new body, which is called the PCI Council. All right, the PCI Council is an independent entity which is completely isolated. It is separated from the five payment brands, and it was created with the intent of managing PCI DSS. This entity is responsible for creating, maintaining, updating the standards. Right. And how do they do this? They have a three year cycle through which the standards are created. They are updated on an ongoing basis. We'll talk about this as we go down the slides. So 7th of September 2006, as you can see over here, the PCI Council was formed. What is the difference between the PCI Council and payment brands? This is important for us to understand. The PCI Council will create new standards. PCI DSS is one of the most popular standards, but they have other standards as well, including PA DSS, PCI PTS, and so on. They do not enforce compliance with the standards. The PCI Council is not responsible for enforcing compliance with PCI DSS. They don't do that. The payment brands will do that. Visa, MasterCard, JCB, Amex, etc. They will talk to HSBC. They will talk to Citibank. They will talk to all of the banks which is which are under their purview and tell them guys the merchants who are reporting to you you need to make sure that they are compliant with pci dss pci council manages qualification and accreditation for qsas asvs and so on what is a qsa i just mentioned briefly that i used to be a pci qsa a pci qsa is a pci qualified security assessor he or she is an authorized auditor who is enabled, who is empowered to perform PCI DSS audits and certify organizations in the standard. So the PCI Council is responsible for training as well as maintaining this pool of elite professionals called PCI QSAs. The payment brands have no role to play in your PCI QSA credential. They will, on the other hand, as part of enforcement, issue penalties, fees, etc. if an organization is not compliant, if an organization is breached. You must have heard of this, uh, you know, these in the news reports, uh, Heartland payment systems was breached, Target was breached, so on and so forth. Multiple organizations who are in fact certified PCI DSS but have been breached. They would have to cough out heavy penalties. Who determines these penalties? The payment brands, Visa, MasterCard, Amex, JCP, etc. They they have these in contractual agreements that they signed with these banks, with these payment entities, with these merchants. And essentially, for every card the card number which is compromised, for example, they would have to cough out on average four dollars, five dollars. Think about the fact that in a typical breach, you have millions of card numbers which are breached, so fines could go out to the tune of millions of dollars. 
PCA Council is responsible for creating awareness. They are also responsible for promoting participation and feedback to the uh, to enhance payment security. How do they do this? Every single year, they have something called the PCI community meetings. They have an annual conference which they conduct. Members of the participating community, which means payment brands, acquiring banks, merchants, service providers, etc., and also the QSAs and the auditors and so on. They participate in the in these conferences and they give feedback on the PCI requirements. The PCI Council receives these feedbacks, uh, these um, points of feedback, and also sees how they can be incorporated into the next standard, the next revision of the standard. They create awareness on PCI DSS by their websites, by the publications, special interest groups, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All right. There are other standards as well which the PCI Council has launched. Not only PCI DSS, you must have heard about PA DSS because it is applicable for payment applications. What is a payment application? Any application which stores, processes, or transmits cardholder, cardholder or sensitive authentication data. Similarly, PCI PTS, devices which are used for protection of pins, HSMs, hardware security modules, secure configuration devices, SCDs, or even POS terminals. The next time you walk up to car four and swipe your card, you need to think whether these POS terminals are compliant with the PCI PTS standards. Now, one of the things to think about when you're looking at PCI DSS, how is it? How does it stand compared to other standards? You very often hear it being said PCI DSS is not a law. GDPR for that matter is a law. It's a regulation and it is enforceable by law. But PCI DSS is what we call an industry regulation. It's not a government legislation. It's not a law. It's an industry regulation. Some states in the US have mandated PCI DSS as part of their law itself. And in fact, not only in the US, in other parts of the world as well, there are some governments which have made it mandatory for certain organizations to comply with PCI DSS. Side note, this actually speaks volumes about the efficiency of the standard in achieving security. PCI DSS, the first version, goes back to December 2004. Pretty old regulation, pretty old standard. And uh, the regulatory, the standard or the regulation itself took effect only on 2005, June 30. So 15 year old standard, and it's been through a number of revisions, number of iterations. This diagram, which is taken from the PCI Council itself, their, or their actual website, speaks to us about how the standard goes through a three year review. The standard is published in year one. It is effective in the same year itself, between November and Jan. And there is a timeline for the whole market to implement it. Feedback begins in point number four in November. And the old standards are no longer applicable. The old version of the standard is no longer applicable from December 31st of the first year, of the second year, sorry. Again, feedback goes on and revisions come in. Final review in May and July. So there's a three year life cycle and I mentioned to you that PCA Council has the community meetings, those conferences where they take feedback. They solicit feedback on the efficiency of the standard and meeting its objectives. This is what happens here in the community meetings that are highlighted over here. All right, so three year life cycle wherein this new version is, pro is published. There is an interim period where you have an option of complying with the previous version or with the new version. In the second year, you have the old version which is being retired. Feedback review goes on and final review happens. At the end of third year, this version, the latest version is, re is retired and the new version has to make way for it. Today, we are in version 3.2.1, which is dated 2018 of May. All right, so we had version 3.2. And then that was immediately followed through with version 3.2.1 with minor updates, minor changes. Um, there, was, there are different types of changes which you will see in each version of each iteration of PCI DSS. You might have additional information, you might have clarification, or you might have updates. So additional information and clarification are not very serious or not very significant changes. 
actual updates are where you have significant changes to, to the uh, requirements of the standard itself. So in the latest version, there was minor changes or minor clarifications in requirements two and four, which we'll talk about as we go down the slides. And then as well as in Appendix B, speaking about compensating controls. What are compensating controls? Compensating control is um, where in a scenario you're, where you're not able to comply with a particular requirement of PCI DSS, you can demonstrate that you're mitigating the risk of not complying by applying other controls which meet the original intent, the original rigor of the actual PCI DSS requirement itself. So for instance, in PCI 3.4, you have a requirement that you need to encrypt cardholder data. Right, so you're not able to go to the extent of encrypting cardholder data, so you decide to select some additional uh, or separate compensating controls, which are not a PCI DSS requirement by themselves, but they will actually meet the intent of protecting stored cardholder data. How, what are these controls? This really depends on your unique circumstances and your unique risk profile. You'll have to ensure that you're mitigating the risk of cardholder numbers being stored in clear text and not being encrypted. Okay, we're jumping over to the second section of today's training, which is anatomy of a payment card. Um, I will periodically be checking for any for any questions, for any uh, comments or feedback. Feel free to keep typing away. Uh, the message from yeah, from Srinivas speaking about the voice breaking too much. I hope it is fixed. Uh, Srinivas uh, uh, and Gary has confirmed. Thank you so much, Gary, that it is uh, clear and that you're uh, that I'm audible. So there's another question from um, Gary. So even if the POS terminal is encrypted from end to end, do you still need network segmentation? Uh, the answer is yes, Gary, because uh, network segmentation is requirement one and encryption of cardholder data is requirement four. When it is being transmitted, it is requirement four. So these are two different requirements. They do not substitute for each other. So yes, even if it is encrypted, you would have to go for segmentation. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you. And everybody who's in the room, thank you for uh, for your participation, including those who were not able to join when we uh, when we started. Those were a little a little late. Um, thank you for being here with us, and feel free to type away your questions as and when they come in. We are going to go through each and every question as part of today's training. All right. With that, let's get jumping into the anatomy of a payment card itself. Now this image that you see over here is is uh, is nothing new to everybody in this particular room. We we probably have, I don't know, five or ten of these in our wallet already. But have you paid close attention to these cards? The next time you pick it up, take a minute to try and understand the different components of your payment card itself. So there are different parts to it to it, which we will try and understand right now. You have your 16 digit card number. This 16 digit card number is the most important part of PCI DSS. It's many of the requirements are focused on how to ensure this 16 digit card number does not get breached. So this is your card number. You have your expiry date and you have your cardholder name personalization, so to speak. All right, so let's take these different entities together. This is what constitutes cardholder data. Your card number, your expiry date, the cardholder name. There you'll also find different logos pertaining to your bank, pertaining to whether it's Visa, MasterCard, your payment brand and so on. Your bank logo will also be here. You have your chip, which is embedded within the card itself. Chip has greatly replaced the need for magnetic stripes. Chip, magnetic stripe, the signature, sorry, the signature panel, the six or seven, sorry, the three or seven digit uh, CVV that you see here is in fact three digit CVV that you see over here, and the hologram. All of these are visible to you on the reverse of your card. So the chip, the mag stripe data, the three digit CVV that you type over here, as well as your pin which is embedded within the chip or the magnetic stripe depends on the case. All of these constitute what we call sensitive authentication data or SAD. If you remember on the very, very first slide or the second slide, we spoke about who does PCI DSS apply to? 
any entity that stores, processes, and transmits cardholder data and slash or sensitive authentication data, PCI DSS applies to them. So any entity that is storing, processing, and or transmitting data that you see on this particular slide, PCI will apply to them. So here is a complete breakdown of the different kinds of data that I was telling you about. You have cardholder data and sensitive authentication data. So cardholder data consists of your cardholder number, that, that 16 digit number that you saw. Side note again, if you're using an Amex card, you will have a 15 digit number. It's not a 16 digit number, but if it's Visa, MasterCard, JCB or Discover, you will have a 16 digit card number. So that card number is what we call the primary account number or the PAN mentioned over here. Your cardholder name, your expiration date or your expiry date, plus a small two digit code, which is called the service code, which we don't really know. We don't know, know that it exists. It's embedded within the magnetic stripe. The sensitive authentication data consists on the other hand of track data. Track data is part of your magnetic stripe. There are two tracks, namely track one and track two. We will not delve into the details of the track itself today, but it will help entities to identify who is your bank, who is your service provider, uh, I'm sorry, who is your payment brand, what is your PIN, all of this would be embedded within your track data. Your three digit CVV, which is also called as CAV2, CVC2, CVV2, CID, depends on which part of the world you're in, you're in but there are different names, but the one which, which is most commonly used is CVV or CVC. Lastly, you have pins, your three, your four digit pin or blocks of pins as well, depends on the case. Okay. Now, what does PCI DSS tell us about the storage and the protection of cardholder data as well as sensitive authentication data? Primary account number. Can I store it? Yes. Do I need to protect it? Absolutely, yes. Cardholder name. You can store it, but yes, you need to protect it. Service code. You can store it. You need to protect it. Expiry date. Store it, protect it. So what you see over here, the first four bullet points is going back to the previous slide. Cardholder data can be stored, but you need to protect it, which means you need to encrypt it. You need to hash it. You need to truncate it. Different options are there. We'll speak about this. Magnetic stripe data, CVV, pin, pin block. Absolutely no storage allowed under PCI DSS. Do not store sensitive authentication data. Going back to the previous slide, sensitive authentication data is to be is not to be stored under any circumstances under PCI DSS. If you find that someone is storing this, it's an apps, it's an immediate fail of their PCI DSS audit. Since they can't store it, there's no question of whether you can protect you need to protect it or not because it does not apply. Now we have completed section number two where we have now understood the anatomy of a payment card. All right, so we started with a very brief history of PCI DSS, and then we jumped into the anatomy of a payment card where we understood the different components of a payment card itself. What we're gonna do now is we will understand the ecosystem of a payment process. Like I said earlier, the next time you walk up to a merchant, whether it's Carrefour, whether it's your local, um, I don't know, clinic or whatever it is, and you swipe your credit card or debit card, you will recall what we're going to discuss right now. There are different entities in a payments ecosystem. There is a card holder, which is you or me, the person who's holding the card, the debit or the credit card. There is an issuer or the issuing bank with whom you have a relationship. It may be Citibank, it may be HSBC, whichever bank it is. You have an account with them and they have given you a debit card and slash or a credit card. So far, so good. At the other end, you have merchants. Let's take the example of Carrefour. Carrefour is accepting payments on POS terminals. These POS terminals are given to them by an acquiring bank. All right, so you have yourself with your issuing bank and you have 
merchants with the acquiring banks. In between this entire ecosystem, you have this whole world of payment brands. Visa, MasterCard, Amex, Discover, and JCP. These five entities, if the card that you are swiping belongs to any of these five entities, or if the POS terminal that Carrefour is accepting is issued, is accepting payments which are issued by cards belonging to these five entities, PCIDSS will apply. Let's try to understand the process in a little bit detail right now. First of all, we will start with acquirers. Who are these acquirers? Acquiring bank is a bank with which the merchant or the business holds their funds. So Carrefour has an account, a merchant account, in fact, with their acquiring bank. The acquiring bank will give them POS terminals or the equipment to accept payment cards. So the POS terminal into which you swipe your card, it'll have the logo of this particular acquiring bank. Pay attention next time, you'll surely see it next time you walk up to make a payment. They will deposit funds into the merchant's account once a credit card sale goes through. What does this mean? I will tell you when we speak about the process. So let's just hold on to this thought and we'll discuss this when we speak about the process involved when you swipe your card. Examples are Wells Fargo, JPMC, um, whatever. I mean, the list is long. All the major banks in the world are acquiring banks. Payment brands, which is the Visa, MasterCard, Amex, JCB, they form their main selling point is the availability of a network which connects all major banks worldwide. You have a Visa card which was issued in the UK and you're traveling, of course, um, once the COVID-19 situation eases out, you're traveling in Hong Kong. Your card is accepted in Hong Kong. It doesn't matter that you got it from the UK. Have you thought about why? The common factor is Visa or MasterCard, whichever it is. This is a global network that they offer that connects banks across the world and allows them to accept as well as transfer payments between each other. The payment brands are responsible for setting up interchange fees as well as assessment fees. What is all these fees? I will talk about this when we speak about the payment process. The most common payment brands are these five logos, Visa, MasterCard, Amex, Discover, and JCB. Issuing bank is the cardholder's bank. Like I said, you have an account with Citibank. Citibank is the issuing bank. They will determine whether you have the amount required to make a transaction. When you type an incorrect PIN, they will tell you you've typed the incorrect PIN. When you make a transaction, you, when you try to purchase something for, I don't know, 60,000 dirhams, but your daily limit is only 40,000 dirhams, they will be the ones who tell you that. You have exceeded your daily limit. Issuing banks, examples, HSBC, City, etc., etc. The list is long. Merchants are the entities that accept the payment cards with the logos of any of those five payment brands. Pretty much any merchant in the world who is accepting payment through cards, if they say that we accept all credit card or debit card um, payments, which includes Visa, MasterCard, JCB, or whatever it is, they are whom we call a merchant in the PCIDSS ecosystem. Now, there, is a different, there are different ways in which you can categorize these merchants depending upon the number of transactions that they are accepting within a given time period. This prioritization of merchants is required in order to identify their risk profiles. If you're a level one merchant, you are accepting as many as 6 million payments every year. So major retailers, major hospitality chains, whatever it is, major even e-commerce e, um, e platforms, where you're accepting at least 6 million transactions every single year, you are level one. Similarly, you have different buckets going all the way down to 20,000 transactions a year. You're just level four if you are less than 20,000 transactions per year. So depending upon which category you're falling into, you have different compliance requirements. If you are level one, every year a QSA has to do an on-site review. 
you will have to have a self assessment questionnaire. I'm sorry, it's not required. The self assessment questionnaire is not required because it is covered in the on site review itself. You will have to do a network security scan, which is vulnerability assessments, penetration testing, quarter vulnerability, quarterly vulnerability assessments, annual penetration testing. So if you're a level one merchant, you will have to be certified every single year by a QSA. If you're level two, three or four, you don't require annual certification, recertification, etc., but you will require something called a self-assessment questionnaire. What is an SAQ? An SAQ is where you can yourself fill out a questionnaire which will assess or benchmark your security posture. There are different kinds of SAQs and you'll have to follow the approved one which is available on the PCI Council's website. There are, there are different types of SAQs depending upon the type of the organization itself. Going all the way down to level four where SAQs and network security scans are only recommended, they are not mandated. We'll talk about the actual process. We've understood the different entities. We've understood merchants. We've understood acquirers. We've understood issuers. Cardholders are, of course, ourselves, the customers who are walking up to a merchant to make a payment. What is a process that flows every time you swipe your card? Bear in mind, the whole process lasts less than, less than two seconds, but we'll try to understand and break it down very quickly right now. Take a scenario. This cardholder is myself, Praveen Joseph, cybersecurity consultant here at Ingram Micro. I have a credit card which was given to me by HSBC. My issuing bank is HSBC. I'm walking up to a retailer or a merchant. Let's take the example of Carrefour. And I'm making a payment after, per, you know, at, at the checkout counter. I'm swiping my card. The POS terminal that Carrefour is using was given to them by Citibank. So Citibank is the acquirer, HSBC is the issuer. What is the process that follows? The first process is what we call authorization. Cardholder presents the credit card at the point of sale terminal, where I'm swiping my card. My card details will be sent to the acquiring bank. The post terminal rate takes it, and of course it has a direct feed into the acquiring bank, which in this case is Citibank. Citibank will read the details pertaining to my card, to my credit card or debit card. Now, what are these details? This is where you need to recall what we spoke about in the anatomy of a payment card. We spoke about my card number. We spoke about cardholder name. We spoke about service code and expiry date. All of this is, in required, uh, is required information. We also spoke about my PIN, the four digit PIN, we spoke about the track one and track two data, which is part of your magnetic stripe. We spoke about the three digit CVV or CVC code as well. All of this would also be assimilated into the transaction. Now, Citibank will make no sense out of this. They don't know who I am because I don't have a card from Citibank. They will have to speak to HSBC Bank because HSBC is the issuer in this particular case. They don't have a direct feed to HSBC. This is where the payment network comes into the picture. Citibank will speak to Visa because this is a Visa card. They will immediately forward my details to the payment brand network. The payment brand network, they will look at the track one track two data. They will look at the bin number of the card, which is the first, four, first few digits of your card number, and they know immediately which bank this is. They know that this is a HSBC card they will perform the routing to the issuing bank. Now the issuing bank, they have my details on the database. This is the next process, authentication. They need to first of all authenticate Praveen Joseph. I've entered that four digit pin. Is it the correct pin? They will do this. They will verify and say he's entered the correct pin. I've said that I'm going to pay, I'm going to check out uh, and make a payment of, I don't know, 50 dirhams or 100 dirhams, depends on what the payment, uh, or the value of the purchases. If I don't have this particular amount in my balance, or if I have exceeded my credit card limit for the month, the transaction would be declined. The issuing bank immediately gives a response and tells you, your transaction has been approved. 
or it will say no, Mr. Praveen, your transaction has been declined. So author authentication, authorization, all of this has happened completed over here. Now, if you remember, let's take the case of a credit card rather than a debit card. The money is not the money is not paid out to anybody as yet because as since it's a credit card, I only need to pay the issuing bank one month later or two months later, depends on the case. The issuing bank will have to now pay somebody for that time period till my credit card statement is due. The issuing bank will place a hold on that amount in my cardholder account in my credit card account. And the merchants pass terminal will perform something called batch processing. It performs something called clearing and settlement. This is the final step. What happens in this step? We will try to understand here. At the end of the day, at the end of the business day, Carrefour, they will consolidate all of the authorization requests and they will forward them to the acquiring bank. So all the credit card payments that were made on that particular POS terminal on that particular day, they would be consolidated into one batch request and they will be sent over to Citibank. Citibank will route this information to the payment run network in a clearing message. Now, as you can imagine, there are going to be multiple banks in this batch request. I, there was one customer who came in from HSBC, another customer who came in from some other bank, bank, bank two, bank three, bank four, and so on. The payment brand network is now going to separate. It's going to break down this clearing message and it's going to forward it to every single issuing bank. Within 24 to 48 hours, the issuing bank is going to pay the acquiring bank and the acquiring bank is going to pay the merchant. So HSBC, which was my issuing bank, it will pay uh, Citibank and Citibank is going to pay Carrefour. This is how it works. And of course, a payment brand is going to collect some processing fees, some transaction fees as part of the entire process. Right. This is why small merchants, they tell you that unless you're going to buy something which is worth 10 dirhams or 20 dirhams, you're not going to swipe your card. We don't accept card payments because the fees the acquiring bank will find a way to push the fees onto themselves and unless the margin is high enough, they do not want to pay this fees. But of course, the larger retail chains, the level one merchants, they have so many transactions that the fees are easily justified. Even if you're just buying something for half a dirham, you can swipe your credit or debit, credit, credit or debit cards. It doesn't matter. So this was the payment process in a very, very small nutshell. Authorization authentication, clearing as well as settlement. To sum it up, to summarize again, I'll take you back to the main slide. Cardholder walks up to the POS terminal, swipes their credit card. The merchant will forward this particular request to the acquirer. The acquirer forwards it to the payment network. Payment network contacts the issuer. Issuer, issuer will check and say yes, he's entered the pin correctly and yes, he has the money required for this payment and they will approve it. If the answer to either of these questions is no, the transaction is declined. After this process is completed, the issuer will pay the acquirer and the acquirer will pay the merchant. How does this happen? At the end of the business day, the merchant will consolidate all the card transactions on that particular POS terminal in a batch request and send them over to the acquirer. The acquirer will send them over to the payment network and the payment network will distribute it across the different issuing banks. The one which corresponds to this particular cardholder, the issuing bank will, will review it and it will say, yes, this was an approved transaction. It will pay the acquiring bank. The acquiring bank will pay the merchant. Visa, they will collect their transaction fees. I do apologize. I realize this slide looks really messy with the uh, with the hand drawn notes. But I had to summarize the whole process. I hope that you understood it as well. Any questions? Oh, no questions so far. It couldn't have been so clear. Come on. So feel free, everybody. Type your questions as they hit your mind. Don't wait for me to ask you. Feel free to just keep your questions coming in and we are very happy to take them as and when you when you give them out. All right. I will be periodically checking the chat as well. All right. 
Now we're going back to the slides and we're jumping into the heart of the presentation itself, which is PCI DSS requirements. Here, what we will do is we will try and understand the intent behind each requirement and the core components of each requirement. Like I said, we're not going to jump into the details of how you're going to implement these requirements because we don't have the time for that in today's training. This is a, a, a short abridged version of a two day training where we will in detail dissect and analyze each and every sub requirement of PCI DSS. This is a longer training which I've delivered uh, and I continue to deliver by, by the way since the last many years. Feel free to get in touch with me if you wish to if you wish to um, join us in one of these classes or you wish to have a special PCI DSS training specifically for your organization as well. We are happy to deliver this for you. All right. Broadly, PCI DSS requirements can be classified into these six categories. The first one is build and maintain a secure network and systems. Requirements one and two will fall under this particular bracket. What is the objective of this particular section? Irrespective of how much data you're storing, who is accessing this data, what are the technical controls you have around it? The first requirement of PCI DSS itself tells us, let's start with your network. This is as good as telling you when you want to build a house, I want to have the blueprint of this house laid out in a secure manner. This is exactly what we're trying to do over here. The network or the blueprint of your organization's cardholder data environment has to be secured. This is what we will achieve in requirement one and in requirement two, we will talk about something called vendor supplied defaults. We will try to identify the risks associated with using this, the default configurations of devices and how you'll have to eliminate those risks. Requirement three and four will fall under the second category, which is protect cardholder data. If you're storing cardholder numbers, you know that if you remember, PCI DSS allows you to store cardholder numbers. You can store cardholder data, expiry date, the name of the cardholder, the 16 digit card number. You can store it, it's fine, but you will have to protect it. How do you do this? We will talk about that over here. Not only can you store it, you can also, and you definitely have to also transfer it or transmit it. If you're going to do this, what are the requirements? Requirement four will tell, tell you about this. We will cover that as part of requirement four. Requirement five and six talk about vulnerability management. Five is what I like to call the antivirus requirement because it tells you how to configure, how to set up and how to manage an antivirus program on your cardholder data environment. One of the things that I told you right when we started today's training is PCI DSS is extremely granular, extremely technical. It goes down to the extent of telling you what devices you need to have antivirus configured on, what is the periodicity of your antivirus scans, what are the privileges that you can give to the end users and so on and so forth. In requirement six, which comes in again under vulnerability management, we will talk about secure application development, secure system development lifecycle. Requirements seven and eight talk about access control. There, these two requirements are what I like to call the need to know requirement as well as the accountability requirement. The entire identity and access management ecosystem would be covered over here. Requirement 9, 10 also fall, up or fall, fall within this category, wherein you'll talk about physical security and log management. Requirement 11 is where we talk about testing. Testing pertains to vulnerability assessments, penetration testing, having an, uh, a process to detect wireless networks and so on, which comes in at requirement 11. We'll talk about that here. And lastly, having an information security policy, which is the last requirement of requirement 12. OK, what we are going to do now is go through each requirement and try to understand the intent and the design of the requirement itself. I will repeat again, we are not going to go into detail about the how to aspects of meeting the requirements because that will not be met within the limited time that we have. There are 300 plus sub requirements under the under each of these requirements. 
So it's a very, very uh, deep and granular uh, set of uh, requirements, the whole standard itself. We'll start with requirement one, install and maintain a firewall configuration to protect cardholder data. All systems should be protected from unauthorized access from untrusted networks, such as e-commerce, employee internet access to desktop browsers, employee email access, dedicated connections, including B2B connections, which are your WANs, for example, wireless networks, etc. This is the core background of requirement one. Have a secure network configuration and ensure that the systems are protected from untrusted networks as well as networks which are part of your day to day business operations, but they have higher risk profiles than what would be anticipated for a secure cardholder ecosystem. This requirement is what I like to call the firewall requirement, and it covers every single aspect of secure network configuration as well as management. It talks about network change management, which means you need to have a ch proper change management process defined and implemented. When was the last time you've seen this in a small organization? Maybe when you speak to a firewall administrator, there is a requirement from someone who says, uh, Mr. Firewall admin, I need you to whitelist www.facebook.com for me. He just goes ahead and does it for them. In a larger, more regulated organization, this would raise a lot of red flags because you need to go through a proper change management process. Someone has to make a request, someone has to review it, someone has to approve it. Only then can it be implemented. After it is implemented, someone has to do a review to see if it is implemented in the correct way. Proper separation of duties, proper process for change management. This is what PCIDSS asks you. However, if you're speaking to the non-compliant organizations, the smaller organizations, those who are in a less regulated setting, you will have, see a lot of cases where people are simply able to speak to the firewall admins and they're just directly white labeling. URLs directly giving them access to um, locations and websites, which there is no approval uh, ticket raised for. There is no approval mechanism in place. Requirement one also tells you that you need to have a proper network diagram. Without the network diagram, you don't know how to or where to begin securing your network. So you need to have an updated network diagram. You also need to have an updated cardholder data flow diagram, which shows you from a business perspective, where does cardholder flow? Where does it reside? Where is it stored within your organization's network? These two components, network diagram plus data flow diagram, are fundamental towards scoping your PCIDSS engagement. Without this, you don't know which components are in scope, which components can be scoped out. Proper roles and responsibilities have to be defined. Separation of duties is incumbent upon roles and responsibilities being defined. For network administrators, general users, external users, whatever the categories are, their roles, responsibilities, privileges have to be defined and documented. A firewall business justification document. What do I mean by this? Take a firewall and look at its configuration. You will see a lot of source IP, destination IP, permit denied kind of configurations. Now, when you're looking at this, how do you know which of these have a valid business need? At the end of the day, IT has to support business. If there is no business need, there is no need for certain sections of IT which are tied to that business need itself. If there is no business need for one particular source IP to match another to, to connect to another destination IP, do not allow it. By default, deny all. We will see this concept being rep repetitive in PCRSS. So if there's no business justification, remove it. And how do you track this? Firewall business justification document. When was the last time you looked at a firewall and you see certain ACLs in it which are no longer relevant? This is what we try to address in firewall rule review. Every six months, PCI DSS tells you, you need to review your firewall configs. 
You do it manually, you do it using tools, it doesn't matter, but you need to do it every six months. There are tools, by the way, the most popular of which is Nipper, through which you can perform firewall rule reviews, and it tells you which ACLs, which protocols, which ports are used, which are not really secure, not really required by business anymore. They have to be removed. Different firewall architectures are also recommended in PCI DSS, which is what I'm showing you here on this diagram. Maybe you need only one firewall, maybe you need two firewalls. But typically it tells you that you need to have a, a demilitarized zone or DMZ, which is configured between external perimeter points, external wireless networks, untrusted points, etc., as well as your internal cardholder data environment. The DMZ is like a buffer zone which protects internal and you know sensitive servers, sensitive devices, and network segments from untrusted parts of your network, including the internet. It's an it's a buffer zone. So if at all there is something which has to phase inside as well as outside, like your mail server, for example, you can put it in the DMZ. It doesn't have to be on the um, inside. It doesn't have to be on the outside. It can be in between. It also talks about firewall configurations. What po what protocols you cannot allow, including the clear text protocols like Telnet, like FTP and so on, because they transmit data in clear text and are no longer considered to be secured. Also, SSL, the earlier versions of SSL, they have been hacked um, very easily. In fact, by by the way, in, in attacks such as uh, Heartbleed, such as Poodle, these are attacks which exploited vulnerabilities in SSL version one and so on. These protocols are explicitly disallowed in PCI DSS, explicitly forbidden. This is why I'm telling you PCI is extremely granular. It goes down to the extent of telling you which protocols you can't use. Telnet, FTP, SSL earlier versions, etc. All of this you will see it in requirement one. Jumping over to requirement two. Ever since COVID-19 started playing out, we've all been working from home. And we've in fact been thankful that we have strong wireless connections, Wi-Fi networks at home. When was the last time you took a look at that Wi-Fi router, which is supporting your, your work activities at home so diligently. When was the last time you took a look at the security configuration of that router? By default, if you're purchasing, for instance, a Linksys router or a D-Link router, if you reset that router and then Google, just Google, default admin username and password for Linksys router model number D41000 or whatever it is, you can easily find it right there thrown back at you on Google. What is the username? What is the password? Ad username is admin, password is 0000 or admin123, whatever it is. You can easily pick it up off the internet. Now consider a scenario where you are the network administrator for a reputed hospital. Same mistake. Trust me, this happens more often than you can imagine. Same mistake where people forget to change these default admin usernames, admin passwords of network devices, servers, and so on. This is what PCI DSS will tackle in requirement number two. Do not use any vendor supplied default usernames, default passwords. These have to be changed before these devices are pushed into production access on the, on the cardholder data environment. What are the components? The first one is change vendor supplied default passwords whether it's a firewall whether it's a router or any other network component or server or any device go ahead change those vendor supplied default usernames default passwords provide only one primary function per server what do i mean by this if you're for example reviewing the pci dss compliance posture for a small organization, with those on a low budget, by the way, a lot of organizations today are on a low budget thanks to the pandemic. We want to cut costs. Everybody wants to cut costs. I don't want to invest on five physical servers, one for antivirus, one for patch management, one for log management, so on and so forth. I will have one server. On this one server, I will have the central log management console. I will have the central antivirus console. I will have the patch management console. All of this deployed on one server. Think about this from a risk perspective. The security requirements for each of these different servers differ from each other. Antivirus server, is it is acceptable to have it facing the external world because it needs to download the latest antivirus signatures. 
log management server maybe it is not necessary to face the external world your active directory server does not have to face the external world so will you permit internet connectivity to the server or not this is a question we need to address and how pci is tackling this is by telling you you know what you can't do this at all you can't have one server running multiple functions what is the answer to this virtualization cut budget that is fine you don't have the budget to buy five servers that is fine purchase one server but define different vms on the server one vm for active directory another one for log management and so on and so forth and then identify the security requirements for each of these vms go ahead and deploy this manage and maintain it this is what pcrds tells you one primary function per server virtualization absolutely is permitted remove any unnecessary services ports protocols like for example principal if you don't need principal or remove it because it's not the most secure unnecessary ports protocols close all of these and so on encrypt non console admin access what is console admin access if the next time you walk into a data center um you will see hidden somewhere in a corner you'll see a monitor and a keyboard and a cable as well connected to the monitor a console cable very often it administrators network administrators server administrators they use this to directly connect to servers firewalls routers in the in the data center and to directly troubleshoot them it in this particular case this is what we call a console connection to a device in this particular case pci dss has a requirement which we'll talk about later but any other admin access to a firewall or a network device what do i mean by any other access through the network of the organization it teams can connect to these firewalls they don't have to physically walk to the data center they can sit at their allocated workstations and connect to these devices if at all they do so it has to be encrypted which means you cannot use clear text protocols like telnet for authorization of these users because telnet like i said earlier is a clear text protocol which sends their admin passwords and clear they cannot be allowed shared hosting providers must protect each entity's hosted environment and cardholder data multi tenancy the next time you read about cloud and cloud security you will surely see this word multi tenant environments and how to secure them this is what pci dss is covering in requirement 2 to if you're having a cloud service provider who is hosting cardholder data or 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 any other form of data which is pertaining to your cde they need to have controls to have these different environments within the same server logically isolated from each other logically protected from each other there are two banks which are hosted on the same server bank a should not be able to access bank b's data even by if it is only by a misconfiguration or through some sort of error error all right so this covers requirements 1 and 2 build and maintain a secure network as well as systems this is what requirements 1 and 2 was now we're jumping over to the next requirement which is requirement 3 stored card holder data and how you can protect it now pci dss allows us to store card holder data like i said this is okay this is acceptable for your card numbers for your credit card um uh, your expiry dates your your card holder name and what not but you need to protect it different protection methods are allowed not just encryption it allows you to go for truncation masking hashing and so on what are the intricacies of requirement 3 first of all minimize stored card holder data don't store data which you don't need anymore i don't have a just business justification to store this card holder numbers get rid of it how can you implement this requirement pci dss talks about data discovery scans every quarter you are required in pci dss to carry out a data discovery check wherein you will scan your network for card numbers and you will try to make an inventory of card numbers which is stored in your network you know what you are storing once you know this you will have to see which one is not required anymore either because it's obsolete or you don't have a business need anymore go ahead and securely delete it this is what pci dss tells us what do i mean by secure deletion clearing purging um degaussing all of these are examples of secure deletion how to go about and implement them today i will not talk about this guys because this is 
detailed discussion for another day. Do not store sensitive authentication data after authorization. If at all you are an issuer, this is a leeway which PCIDSS gives them. Up to the point when authorization is completed, they can store sensitive authentication data, but if you're not an issuer, no storage of sensitive authentication data at all under any circumstances. What do I mean by up to the point of authorization? If you remember, I told you when we went through this payment process, you will enter your PIN. If that PIN is entered incorrectly, you will not be authorized. If the issuer needs to store the PIN till the process of authorization is completed, they are allowed in PCI DSS to do so. If not, after the authorization process is completed and then there is no need to store the card hold, the sensitive authentication data, do not store it. Do not store track data, do not store CVV, do not store PIN data at all, as you see over here. If you are displaying primary account number, which is your PAN, your 16 digit card holder number, mask it such that only the first six and the last four digits are seen. With this information, it is more than sufficient to uniquely identify individuals if you're using cardholder number as a primary identifier for a particular business process. Beyond that, you're not allowed to display cardholder numbers. If you're storing cardholder number, protect it using encryption, truncation, hashing, as we saw earlier, and not only do you do, need to do this, PCI DSS goes to the extent of telling you how you need to secure the keys for the encryption. You need to have a key custodian. You need to have a defined key uh, life cycle, lifetime period. In fact, lifetime for these uh, keys at, at the end of which you need to reuse or you need to create new keys, expire, retire the old ones, and so on and so forth. The next requirement is where we talk about protection of transmitted cardholder data, especially on the so-called open public networks. What do I mean by this? Okay, there are a few questions which we will look at before we start requirement four. If me as a merchant develops an application that runs on a consumer's device that is used to accept payment card data, what are my obligations pertaining to PCIDSS? Okay, extremely excellent question, Gali. Thank you so much, Mr. Gali. So the question here is, a merchant is developing an application which runs on a consumer's device, like for example, a smartphone. What are my obligations pertaining to PCI PS DSS? Okay, there are two ways in which we need to understand this, requir this question. The first one is PCI obligations, and the second one is PADSS obligations. PADSS will apply if you are developing this application and you're selling it as a commercial application for multiple users, if you're going to sell this for multiple customers, PADSS will apply. You will have to, first of all, achieve compliance with PADSS. But if you're developing it as a tailored application only for one customer, you don't need to go for PADSS. You're not selling it as a commercial off the shelf product. Forget about PADSS. You need to consider PCIDSS. Now, PCIDSS requirements. In PCI DSS, for an application, you will need to consider requirements 3, requirement 4, requirement 6, 7, 8, as well as 10, 11. I'll repeat that. 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 10, as well as 11, as well as 11. Why? I will tell you about this very quickly, Mr. Gali. In three and four, we talk about storage and transmission of cardholder data. So that is why from your application, you need to ensure that you're encrypting cardholder data. If at all, you're storing it and you're masking it as I just told you on your application. In six, we'll talk about secure application development. You need to ensure you're complying with OASP top 10, for instance. You need to ensure you're having formal SDLC. You need to ensure that you're having a web application firewall which is deployed in front of your application if it is an internet facing application in your in your network architecture in seven and eight we'll talk about identity and access control which both apply to applications so you need to think about seven and eight nine is about physical security not so pertinent for applications so we can skip it but 10 speaks about log management extremely important you need to consider that from your application what logs are being generated are they being stored? Are they being um, managed? Are they being reviewed, etc.? You need to consider that. 
Levin talks about vulnerability assessments, penetration testing. You will need to carry out web application, VA web application, PD, and so on. That has to be considered from requirement 11's perspective. So these are the requirements that you need to consider, Mr. Gali, for your particular requirement. Hope this helps. Going back to the slides, requirement four, encryption of cardholder data across open public networks. What do I mean by this? If you are transmitting cardholder data over the internet, over a wireless network, over even SMS or over chat, all of this is what we consider an open public network. And there are some requirements around these circumstances. First of all, if you're transmitting it over these open public networks, encrypt it. PCI DSS refers to FIPS compliant encryption algorithms. FIPS compliant, by the way, this is another whole subject, FIPS compliant encryption algorithms. AES, for example, is considered FIPS, FIPS compliant and different other protocols as well, which are acceptable as per the Federal Information Processing Standards or FIPS. You will have to Google this or review, read about this or join our two day training on PCI DSS where we will cover this, but I can't cover this today. If you are having any wireless network, which is just, which is transmitting cardholder data, encrypt it. You need to use WPA2, WPA with, with pre-shared key, PSK for, PSK for example. WEP is under no circumstances, wireless, sorry, wide equivalency protocol, WEP is under no circumstances acceptable, not only for PCI DSS, but for any wireless network, which is transferring any sort of data. Never send unprotected pans over email, chat, SMS, etc. So the next time you're you're sending cardholder numbers over Skype or email, make sure that you encrypt it. At least put it into a WinZip file and password protected because that AES 128-bit is acceptable as per PCIDS's requirement for. So at least put it into WinZip and password protected. But don't copy paste the card numbers and just put it into your email body and send it over to somebody else, because even if it is sent only inside the company, it is a violation of requirement four. Next requirement, requirement five, which talks about malware, malware management. It tells you that antivirus software should be used on all systems commonly affected by malware. What do I mean by commonly affected? One answer, Windows. It tells you that all Windows systems, you definitely need to have an antivirus installed. Not only that, additional antivirus solutions may be considered to supplement the antivirus software, if at all you wish, but these do not need will, or will not replace the fundamental antivirus software itself that you have in place. Let's jump into the requirement. First of all, install AV on all systems Okay, so any system which is part or par parcel of the cardholder data environment, which is considered commonly affected by malware, all your Windows endpoints, Windows laptops, all your even Linux, by the way, no longer considered to be that secure, you need to have antivirus installed. Maybe the old age mainframe systems are not so vulnerable considered compared to Linux and Windows and so on, so you can't exclude them based on a risk, uh, risk based approach, you can ex exclude them from this requirement. AV signature should be updated at all points. Sorry, at all points. Scanning has to happen on a periodic basis as well, at least every day. Prevent end users from disabling antivirus. Me as an end user should not be having the rights to disable antivirus on my laptop. Very small requirements, four and five. In fact, very small, very simple requirements. But requirement six going all the way up to 12, they are not so small. Six tells us how to develop secure applications. It also tells us how to manage patches. What are the components of requirement six? The first one is patch management. In fact, in patch management, what is a patch by the way, guys? As vendors push applications into production, as and when they push them into production rather, it does not mean that these applications are 100% secure. Every application which is released as a final version still has a lot of inherent bugs, inherent vulnerabilities present, even in the final release version. As these bugs are discovered and as exploits for these bugs are discovered, security ecosystems will start evolving. The risk posture of the application increases. 
this is where bug hunting, sorry, bug bounties and um, uh, zero day attacks come into the picture. Vendors on a periodic basis, they will release fixes, bug fixes or patches to address these vulnerabilities. Now, as an end user of these technologies, we need to have formal mechanisms to identify these patches and push them across all applicable systems. This is what PCI tells us in requirement six. You need to have a risk based prioritization of these patches. You need to have a process to push the patches, have a rollback mechanism in place. If at all the patches have you know, produced unintended effects, you need to have a rollback mechanism. And after you push the patches first on a test bed and then on a production bed, you need to have a post implementation review as well. Then it talks about secure SDLC, which is software development lifecycle, where you need to have a formal and secure mechanism or process for application development. This is one of the more difficult requirements to meet because software developers usually they are not security oriented. They are more functionality oriented. They want to meet their deadlines. They want to get the code to work. They want to have the application to meet all the customer requirements. Security usually is not something which is a priority. Rather, it's an afterthought. This is what PCI DSS tells us should not be the case. You need to have a formal secure development lifecycle wherein security is built into the SDLC itself, whether it's waterfall, whether it's agile development that they're using. Security has to be a part and parcel of it, and it needs to be an ongoing consideration, not something which is thought of just at the time of audit. You need to have a code review mechanism consisting of peer review, lead review as well before code is pushed to production. You need to have a secure coding checklist, which is something that you will get from OWASP top 10 or the SANS top 25. You need to have a web app firewall deployed in front of public facing web application servers. If you don't want to do this, here's the alternative. Perform application scans, web application, uh, web app scans once every six months. So either deploy a WAF or deploy or perform every six months web application scans. One of the most important requirements for application development, and in fact, it answers the question as well, which was raised earlier by Mr. Gali. Thank you, sir. Requirement seven talks about access control on the basis of need to know. Very simple requirement, which tells you unless you have a business need to access cardholder data, you will not access cardholder data. This is what requirement seven is all about. It tells you that you need to first of all define the different roles for people who need to have access to cardholder data. Once the role is defined, give them access only on the basis of need to know. This person is as part of his job description has a need to see cardholder data, so we will give him the access. Not only that, we will give him only the least privileges required to access this cardholder data. He can see the numbers, but he doesn't have to change it. He doesn't have to modify it. So let's not give him those privileges. By default, everybody has zero access. Default deny all. By default, you have no access. Only on the basis of your role, we will give you access. And not only that, we will give you the least permissions, the least privileges after we give you the access. If you want additional, go through that formal change management process that we spoke of earlier. Have a request raised, have someone approve it. Only then can your access be provisioned again by somebody else. Separation of duties. Requirement eight talks about accountability. Identify and authenticate all access to system components, which means I need to have a unique user ID for every person so I know who has done what on my cardholder data environment. It tells you. Sorry, it tells you have a unique user ID and a unique password for all users. Accountability. If I don't know who this person was who carried out this particular action on my cardholder data, I will not be able to investigate when something goes wrong. Not only that, it also tells you provide privileges on the basis of approvals, remove the access for terminated users and so on. It also tells you account lockout. After how many invalid attempts you have entered the wrong password four times, five times, lock your account your session is invalid for 15 minutes your session will time out your password configuration you need to have a minimum of seven characters you need to have alphabets you need to have special characters all of those password security settings you will see that all coming under requirement eight it administrators who are responsible for active directories 
they define AD con servers, they define the users within your organization and they define the password policies, account lockout, session timeout, all of these settings. They will have to set and work on, on requirement eight. Remember people, if you're if you're not speaking, please remember to stay on mute. Um, I do apologize. I've muted everybody as well again. Multi-factor authentication for non-console admin access and all remote access to cardholder data environments, especially now in the aftermath of COVID-19. When people are connecting from home, they have remote connections to the cardholder data environment. They will have to go through two-factor authentication or three-factor authentication, if at all there is a budget for it, which is a scenario where something you know, something you have, something you are. At least two of these somethings are invoked before access is provisioned to the cardholder data. What is this something you know, something you have, something you are? Join our two-day PCI DSS training. We'll talk about this. Requirement nine is a physical security requirement where you restrict physical access to cardholder data. One of the more difficult requirements because it's a very, very, um, I would say subjective requirement. It's not so objective because auditors, when it comes to physical security, they always tell you, you need to ca have a camera over there. One camera is not enough. Uh, you need to have a high, uh, an increased height for this particular fence. This fence is not enough. This height is not enough. Not only uh, do you need to increase the height, you need to have um, uh, you know, broken glass uh, embedded on the top of the wall to prevent people from jumping over the walls and whatnot. So physical security is always an object is always a subjective domain of information security. Difficult, very difficult to achieve compliance with. PCI DSS breaks it down into different domains. It tells you either have CCTV cameras or access control mechanisms where people have to swipe a card. Either, either or it does not tell you to have CCTV mandatory in every place where card data is being processed. Either have a camera or have a preventive access control mechanism in place. Restrict physical access to publicly accessible network jacks which are your ports, your network ports where people can plug in a network cable and then they get access to your network. Wireless access points, handheld devices, point of sale, point of interaction devices, etc. Restrict access to them. Proper visitor management. They have to be escorted. They need to be approved before they are allowed access to the physical security, to the physical premises. They need to be escorted. They need to be distinguished from your regular employees. All of this comes in over here. Media devices where you're taking backups, for example, your hard disks, they have to be physically secured as well. And they need to be um, the backup facilities where they are stored as well need to be secured. All devices which capture cardholder data, like your POS terminals, your point of interaction devices, they need to be inventoried, they need to be protected and secured as well, physically speaking. These are new requirements, by the way, the last bullet point that you see here, uh, more recent, I would say, where uh, you're also instructed to train your employees. You know, the regular guys at Carrefour, for example, who are at the checkout counters, they have to be trained to ensure that these devices are not physically tampered with. One of the more um, rampant forms of cyber fraud or, or ATM related frauds that we are witnessing is that of skimming, card skimming. Uh, read about it when you find time because this is a scenario where people attack because they install, sk install skimming devices on genuine POS terminals, on genuine ATM card machines. These devices impersonate those of the actual bank and but they are actually designed to siphon out card numbers, um, your, your pins and whatnot from, from genuine card holders. So what PCI DSS tells us here is train your staff so they physically inspect these devices periodically and ensure that these skimming devices or any other suspicious devices have not been fixed to these to these POS terminals or any signs of tampering physical damage to the POS terminals because these are all indicators of compromise of these devices. So this is also covered in requirement nine. One of the more recent updates to the standard is um, is what I just discussed here on physical security of POS terminals and point of interaction devices. Requirement nine is one of the most, most specific to the point requirements of PCI because it's about log management. Track and monitor access to cardholder data. It completely talks about log management and what it tells you is that you need to have logs. In fact, I'll show you here. You need to have logs for all the components in your cardholder data. Not only that, it tells you in very, very minute detail what kind of events have to be logged in a specific log what are the different aspects that you need to capture like the ip addresses involved 
the nature of the activity, the date and the timestamp, and even the outcome of the activity. Was it a success? Was it a failure? Every point that I just mentioned is a specific sub requirement in requirement 10. It also tells you that you need to have a proper time synchronization architecture in place. If, for example, you're using a Windows server, you can check it in your registry editor. You will be deriving time um, updates from a particular IP address. This IP address of is your, your is your company's uh, time server, your NTP server, and this server is pulling in time updates from time.windows.com, one of the more respected or more widely followed um, universal sources of time. All your devices should be configured to one central time source whether it's time.windows.com or, or UTC or anything else. This universally acceptable central time zone, uh, sorry, central time source will provide you with a reference point against which all your laptops, all your servers can align themselves. Why is time so important in log management? Imagine that you are investigating an incident, a cyber attack, and you see that the logs are available, but the times are all completely messed up. Uh, one particular event happened like one day ago, another one happened five days ago, but it doesn't make sense because it can't precede the first event. It has to happen only after the first event is carried out. So attackers usually will try to mess up with the timestamps of logs in order to confuse forensic investigators. And this is why PCIDSS tells us you need to have a robust architecture for timestamps. File integrity monitoring, FIM. Attackers will try to delete logs. They will try to tamper with the logs or modify these logs. A file integrity monitoring is a tool which monitors logs and anytime there is a change to the logs, the integrity is modified or corrupted, it throws an alert. All right, OSEC, OSIM, so on. There are multiple such solutions. Um, and these are, by the way, inherent features within security information and event management tools, SIM solutions, by the way. You need to perform log review 24 seven every day you need to review the logs and you need to you need to store the logs for a period of one year one of the most difficult requirements to comply with is requirement 10 guys and you know why because organizations are not willing to spend on something called managed security services if you have a security operation center in-house all these requirements that i just told you will be covered as part of your security operation center SOC. You will have a SIM solution, maybe IBM Curata, maybe it is uh, ArcSight, maybe it is AT&T Cybersecurity, the formerly, which was formerly called as Alien Vault. Whichever it is, all these activities will be man automated and managed by your SIM solution. If you don't have the budget for an in-house SOC, you'll have to go for an outsourced managed security services provider. The next one is requirement 11, where you will be carrying out testing, testing of your architecture, of your infrastructure as well. What are the requirements of requirement 11? Test for the presence of wireless access points. Rogue wireless access points can be set up. Multiple Wi-Fi related act attacks, like for example, the evil twin, the cafe latte attack, etc. Multiple wireless access attacks, uh, wireless network attacks. You can try to mitigate them by carrying out every quarter a scan of all the wireless networks in your environment. This is what we are speaking about in requirement level. First of all, check for the presence of any unauthorized wireless access points. If you see that there are some rogue hotspots set up, maybe by shadow IT teams, maybe by your own employees, maybe by unknown entities, go ahead and investigate. You need to bring them down. Perform a vulnerability assessment every single quarter on your cardholder data environment. All internal facing IP addresses, you will have to do it every quarter by yourself. If it is an external facing IP address, you need to hire a approved scanning vendor, an ASV. One of the earlier slides when we started the training, I spoke about ASVs. Approved scanning windows are those who are attested by the PCI Council themselves. You can get on the PCI Council website and find out which organizations, based on your geographical location, are approved scanning windows approved by the, a by the PCI Council. They will perform a VA for you, and you'll have to hire them to perform a quarterly VA for your organization. Penetration testing also has to be done every year on your internal as well as external IP addresses. And not only do you need to do a pen testing, you'll have to check the efficiency of your network segmentation as part of your pen testing activity as well. How effective are the segmentation techniques that you have deployed? Try and break them. That's what you will have to do in requirement 11 as part of the pen testing. You need to have an IDS or IPS 
configured at all parameter points at all risky points within your organization's cardholder data environment as well and ideas ips will give you an, an, an alarm anytime there is any indicator of intrusion any indicator of a potential compromise all of this comes in at requirement 11. the final requirement is requirement 12 which will bring us to a close as well for today's training maintain a policy for information security this policy will cover multiple domains. I do apologize for the typo over here. It's information security policy. But what you what this requirement asks us is have a policy for information security. Not only that, touch upon all aspects of information security, including, for example, risk assessment. Every year you need to carry out an information security risk assessment for your organization. Have acceptable use of technology have a security awareness campaign, which is every year, train your people on information security. When you're hiring people, this is where the HR have to be pulled in. Make sure that you're carrying out proper background checks and employees have signed NDAs or other agreements which, which where they commit to protecting the cardholder data that they are exposed to. If you're outsourcing to third party service providers, make sure you carried out third party or service provider due diligence, like for example, having the master service agreement in place. And you also um, have these agreements where they will notify you if at all there is a breach. They give you the right to audit them and so on and so forth. Last one is incident management, where if something goes wrong, these days, by the way, it's a matter of when, it's not a matter of if. If or when something goes wrong, you need to have a formal process to detect and respond to these incidents. Two points I'd like to highlight before I close requirement 12. Risk assessment has been in existence in PCI since the year 2012, 2013. In fact, I would say um, this is one of the requirements which which I was also personally a part of uh, its inclusion in PCI DSS. If you remember when I told about PCI Council, I mentioned that um, the PCI Council, they have this three year review life cycle where they solicit feedback during the community meetings. They spread awareness on PCI DSS. And one of the ways they do this is through the special interest groups, SIG. I was part of one of these security special interest groups on risk assessment. The team that I was working for, we were a part of this uh, special interest group and we created a SIG for risk assessment. The SIG was approved and there was a need for risk assessment, which was identified by um, the entire community. And then um, the version of PCI DSS, which came out in 2012, 2013, requirement 12.1.2, which speaks of risk assessment, was introduced in the standard. Since then, there's been a very strong emphasis on risk based compliance. You don't just meet the requirement, but you go beyond that risk-based security uh, approach to securing your organization itself. Another point I'd like to highlight is the need for policies and procedures. Every requirement that I covered now, requirements 1 to 12, the last requirement you will see, it will tell you have appropriate policies and procedures to meet this requirement. PCI has also, was formerly it wasn't so heavy on documentation, but I mean, that used to be something that was um, more for the ISO folks. PCI was more about the technical implementation earlier, but now it has become, uh, it is recognized and is um, appreciating the value of proper documentation, proper governance as well. So in every requirement, you will see uh, the final requirement tell, telling you, you need to have appropriate policies, appropriate procedures as well in place. All right, guys, this brings me to the, this brings me to the close of today's training. Let's, let's shoot your questions. Let's review the questions before we, we conclude. So this question from Mr. Mohammed Al Mahdi for a contact center, like a call center, can we have only TAs certified using only a third party partner like Walkspay to accomplish PCI DSS level one compliance? The idea is to route all the payment processes inside PBX to a third party and retrieve the call when the process is completed. Is there any special requirements for this case? For example, to be a level three or level four PCI compliant. OK, um, I'm not sure I have a, a holistic understanding of your of your particular scenario, Mr. Mohammed. But what I see is that you want to res restrict the exposure to PCI DSS environments. Um, the TA is part certified using only a third party partner like Walkspay to accomplish PCI DSS. 
Okay, I, under, I think I understand your question. And um, I think I, from what I see here, I think this is a valid approach as long as your organization is not storing, processing or transmitting cardholder data, but it is being done by this third party partner like Voxpay, it is acceptable to have them take on the task of PCI DSS compliance and you can minimize, you can limit your exposure or compliance obligations if, if this is possible. So yes, I do believe that this is a valid case. Um, level three or level four. Yes, you can reduce your exposure by routing it to your third party processor. Yes. All right. Thank you, Pand uh, Mr. Sanil Pandit for joining us today. Uh, another question from Mr. Mohammed Kamran. If an organization already implemented ISO, how will PCI be integrated into the existing framework? OK, excellent question, Mohammed. Excellent question. Thank you so much. Um, so for this to answer this question, we need to address where does ISO and PCI overlap with each other? You'll be surprised there is a lot of overlap between the two standards, although ISO is a lot more um, holistic. It is a lot more inclusive and it is a lot more open ended because it gives us a lot of room for interpretation. PCI DSS, on the other hand, is very, very granular, very, very specific. There are some areas where you can identify synergies between the two standards where the where the requirements will overlap with each other. I can I can give you a few of them right now. For example, in the case of background checks, HR screening, ISO will mandate that this has to be carried out and PCI DSS also tells us that this needs to be done. You can check this off and carry it out for both the standards. Secure application development. There is a lot of overlap between ISO and PCI DSS in the domain of secure application development. PCI goes to the extent of telling you you need to follow OASP top 10. Um, I mean, it doesn't explicitly call out OASP, but it, tell, it brings about the um, the 10 components of OASP top 10. ISO also talks about these areas, but not to the extent of detail as PCI DSS. ISO also talks about code review and so on. ISO does not limit itself to cardholder data as, as a fundamental component. It does not talk about compensating controls. It does not talk about segmentation and isolation. All of these are core parts of PCI DSS. So those are areas where you will have to spend some time to spend some effort. So what I can tell you by and large is there are areas where there's a lot of overlap, background checks, application development, incident management, vulnerability management, um, uh, risk management as well. ISO is also extremely uh, heavy on risk assessment as a PCI DSS. So there are a lot of synergies, um, but and they do fit together in a lot of these domains. But PCI will require a lot more detail, a lot more granularity than ISO does. ISO is more open to interpretation. PCI DSS is not. It's more black and white. You either do comply or you don't. ISO, you cannot comply with the requirement and still be certified because um, the risk, you can prove that it does not fit in your risk profile. In PCI, it doesn't. It's not the case. I hope this helped, uh, Mohammed. Thank you so much. So there's a mapping between ISO and PCI DSS, which Mohammed has shared again. OK, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mohammed. We will refer to this. Uh, Azza, thank you so much, Azza. Very happy to have you here with us. Uh, PCI compliance is implemented by issuer, acquirer and payment brands, but do merchant also need to be compliant? Yes, yes, Azza, absolutely yes. Uh, so I'll tell you how this works is um, the merchant, sorry, the payment brands like Visa, MasterCard, etc. They will push compliance obligations on acquirers. Acquirers are like the city banks, the HSBCs and so on. These acquirers, they will push the compliance obligation onto the merchants. So if I am a merchant, I have a shop, a retail shop, let's say, and I'm purchasing a post terminal, which is uh, given to me by, by uh, Citibank. Citibank will impose compliance obligations on me. If I am not complying or if I am breached, for example, Visa will find Citibank, Citibank will find me. That's how it works. So, uh, so yes, everybody in this ecosystem would have to, uh, you know, pursue PCI compliance obligations. I hope this helped. I hope this helped us. Well. All right. I don't see any other questions. If there, if the, if you have questions, feel free to um, sh to shoot them in. I'm 12 minutes delayed. I do apologize. Uh, it took a little longer than anticipated, but uh, I'm really happy that you found the session useful and um, we had a very good participation as well from you. Let me remind you again. We have two day trainings on PCI plus a lot of other security standards, including ISO uh, and the and the more um, recent and more important privacy regulation GDPR as well. Um, 
feel free feel free to get in touch with me to uh, attend one of these trainings for yourself for your organization we are very happy to get collaborating with you on this and uh, this session was recorded it'll be available on our youtube channel as well uh, feel free to check it out over there thank you so much everybody and i wish you an excellent rest of the day thank you from, from on behalf of everybody here at ingram micro cyber security thank you thank you all <laughs>